20 milliliters. Each time, each time the heart contract. So you 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 move forward around 70 milliliters of blood. It's a volume. But you know that uh, your heart beats or contract at the rest around 70 times per minute. Yes. So if you, this is cardiac output, this is cardiac output, the volume, the volume of each uh, contraction is called a stroke volume, stroke volume multiplied by the heart rate. Heart rate is the number of times that the heart contract in one minute. If you do this multiplication with a calculator, you are going to have 4,900, okay, 4,900 milliliters per minute, which is mm, almost 5,000, no? It's near 5,000, I'm rounding, I'm rounding because I want to, 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 to work, okay, minute, okay? So each minute, if you are at rest and you have normal heart, you pump around 5,000 milliliters of blood each minute, which is five liters, 5,000 and five liters, okay? So this is the cardiac output of a normal person in average or at rest. But what happened, for example, if you start exercising? What happened with the heart rate if you exercise? Increases or decreases? Of course, increases, because there is a, it increased demand of the muscle uh, of circulation and oxygen. So now suppose, suppose that using the same formula that still you are you know, pumping each, uh, each, in each stroke, in each bit, the same 70 milliliters. And in reality it's increased, but let's keep it constant, constant so you understand. But now your heart rate increases. Let's see, because you are exercising, you are running, it is you are going to increase your heart rate to 100 beats per minute. You know that when you are exercised, you, you can increase even much more than that, okay, if you are exercising, okay? This is expected that when you are exercising, okay, your heartbeat increases, yeah. So now, what is the result? 7,000. So do you see how the cardiac output changes, just changing the heart rate, okay? Okay, uh, a minute. So now they, ask you a question in English. It is an English question. How is the cardiac output in anemia? In anemia. They make this question in English. Is in A, increase, increase, okay? B, decrease, C, no change, okay? No change, okay? And D, another distractor. So I want now you, that you answer. How do you think is going to be the cardiac output in a person that has the hemoglobin in nine? Hemoglobin nine because has anemia. Okay. So how do you anticipate is going to be the cardiac output? A increase or D or B decrease or C not change. Uh, any idea? Increase. Increase. Everybody agree? This increase? Yes. Okay. So I agree with you, and this is the correct answer. It's increased. Why? Because now having less hemoglobin, the heart needs to compensate moving the few red blood cells that you have more frequently because you need to keep the same capacity of transportation of oxygen, but the only way you have decreased transporters, you have decreased okay, buses to transport the oxygen is to make those buses move faster. Okay, and this is what you see. Usually in anemia, what we see is an increment of the heart rate as if you were exercising, and for that reason, the cardiac output increases. So it can be transferred to other uh, um, clinical situations. They can ask you, how is the cardiac output in hyperthyroidism? Increase or decrease? Quickly, answer. Decrease. In hyper hyperthyroidism, 
You have tachycardia and hyperthyroidism. No, and hyper and hyper. Epicin increase, less um, potassium. Potassium. What have to do the potassium increase the thyroid? Okay, okay, it's good because remember that we have here a study group, and the idea is to study here and to clarify doubts and correct mistakes here, not in the day of the NCLEX. The idea of this meeting is this is a study group, and it's okay, it's okay, it's good. It's, it's, I'm, I'm very happy, very happy when you commit mistake here because I had the opportunity of correcting that. I'm talking about thyroid, thyroid. And I say hyper, hyper, hyper thyroidism, okay? Hyperthyroid, okay? Which is the Graves disease, you already studied that, no? So those clients are the clients that are all time hot, are the clients that are losing weight, the client that has those popping out uh, eyeballs, that is called uh, exophthalmus, and people that have tachycardia, a lot of tachycardia. So if, they, if the patient has tachycardia and the formula of cardiac output is the volume multiply heart rate, then the cardiac output needs to be increased because if the heart rate increases, if one of the factors increases, all the product need to increase, you understand? So in hyperthyroidism, the, uh, the heart rate increases and then the cardiac output increases. But the hyperthyroidism has no relation or direct relation with the potassium. The one that has a strong influence in the potassium and is an endocrine disease are the Cushing, the Cushing disease, and the uh, Addison disease. Okay, in Addison the potassium is high, in Cushing the potassium is low. I think that this the confusion that you have. If I'm wrong. Clarify me, okay? But I think that this is what the context. So, so don't include the potassium in this scenario because it's, it's not it's not related. Are we good? If you don't understand my explanation, still there is doubt. Please feel free of asking. So in hyperthyroidism, that when you have tachycardia, you expect a cardiac output that is increased. By the contrary, in hypo, hypo down, hypothyroidism, then you that the heart rate is decreased, you expect a decreased cardiac output, etc., 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 etc. Situations in which they can use the term cardiac output uh, associated with different okay, pathophysiologies and clinical scenario where you apply the concept of cardiac output. Is okay. Very good. So in this same uh, um, primitive uh, 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 draw that draw that 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 I did, okay, we can also talk a little about symptoms of right heart failure and symptoms of left heart failure. This is the right heart. If this heart is a failing, then there is a failure of moving the blood in this direction, yes, in this direction. So as a consequence, the blood will build up, okay, with back, back flow, okay, backward. It's like a traffic jam. It's like going, driving through the, the expressway and there is an accident. There is no a, 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 a fluent movement of the traffic. So now what happened is it's going to build up a traffic jam backward. So if the accident is here, the traffic jam is going to build up backward. Yes, it's a backflow of traffic. Yes. So this is what you expect in right heart failure. And it's very simple. So if if you have this traffic uh, you know, uh, backflow uh, in the superior vena cava, you can see that here. You can see that in the uh, neck vein, in the neck veins, no? In the neck veins, okay? In the neck veins, in these veins that you saw here, yeah? So neck vein distension or jugular, external jugular vein distension is a manifestation of right heart failure. We study that we to measure this, we keep the patient, uh, you know, recumbent 
on bed, but we elevate the head of the bed at 45 degrees because it's the standardization. And then you see this tension of the vein in this position. You see, oh, there is a neck vein distension. What means that there is too much blood, too much blood inside this vein. Okay, too much blood inside this vein that cannot enter here and not and cannot move in this direction. Okay, with efficiency because there is a failure of the right sided okay pump. But then at the same time in the inferior vena cava, you are going to notice that there is a build up of blood, a build up of blood, okay, of blood here in 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 the the organs that drain to the inferior vena cava. Being the lower extremities in a dependent, a down position, okay, a dependent position, because usually those patients are sitting or are standing. They don't tolerate the 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 flat position very well. And of course, during the day, they are not uh, on bed, they are sitting or, or, or they are standing, yes? So now you are going to anticipate there is going to be an important accumulation of liquid in the lower extremities presenting as edema, edema of the lower extremities, no? Edema of the lower extremities. And it is because the lower extremities are in dependent position, in dependent position, are you not down because you are sitting, yeah? You are sitting during the day. So during the day, especially in the afternoon, you are going to have very swollen legs as a manifestation of this condition, very swollen legs. Okay, there is a lot of liquid, liquid accumulated in the legs because the gravity force will pull this liquid toward your legs. Okay, and this is okay the edema in the lower extremities. But also, uh, if there is too much liquid retained, this edema can also include the abdomen, and then you can have congestion of the liver. It's called hepat uh, congestive hepatomegaly. It's very painful. By the way, when you palpate the liver, you palpate the liver enlarge and painful, and even you can compress push the liver with your hand in the abdomen, and you see how the pains of the neck distend even more because the blood, the blood that is pulled here in the liver, which is a lot, has been, you know, moved by your hand, by the, the pressure of your hand in this direction. And, and there is communication here. It's called hepatojugular reflux, hepatojugular reflux. And uh, those are manifestation of right heart failure. Uh, when you have the, the abdomen uh, full of liquid and the liver enlarged uh, because the right heart failure, the stomach is here, the stomach is here, and then the stomach is going to be compressed by the liquid and the enlarged heart, and then you have like a sensation of, of fullness, and you can have anorexia as part of this manifestation. And a very interesting detail, during the day, during the day you are sitting, when you are sitting, okay, when you are sitting, your legs are very swollen because the liquid, the excess of liquid, the fluid volume excess is accumulated in the lower extremity. But at night, what you do at night, you go to bed and then you go to bed at night, okay, you are a regular bed, Okay, a regular bed in a house, in a normal house, a regular bed, and you go to bed. This is the bed, this is the pillow, and then you go to bed. And the person is going to rest in bed. But now the legs are very swollen, and then because they are very swollen, maybe the patient prefers to elevate the legs in pillows. No, so now the legs that are swollen are going to be elevated. Okay, elevated in pillow, but. What is going to happen with this liquid when you elevate the legs, when you at night, when you go to bed? Well, this liquid is going to move in this direction. So now you can see in the back of the patient edema. The legs are going to improve. So the legs are going to, to, to have, okay, a loss of liquid. And then you notice in the morning that the legs are thinner. The legs decrease, okay, decrease the edema because the liquid is moving from the legs to the back of the patient. But now if you explore pitting edema in the sacral area of the client, you can notice that 
now the liquid is in the bag of the client because the bag becomes the more the more de the most dependent part of the body but some of this liquid that was trapped in the legs is going to be reabsorbed is going to be reabsorbed and during the night is going to pass through the lungs okay can produce problems while passing through the lungs this excess of liquid that was okay sequestrated in the legs is going part of this liquid is reabsorbed through the process of reabsorption and then part of this liquid is going to end in the left heart and the left heart will pump this liquid to the kidneys kidneys are here the renal arteries are direct branches of the ear so now the kidneys during the night are receiving more liquid which liquid the liquid that was trapped sequestrated okay or uh, uh, kept in the in the legs that now during the night this liquid is moving is mobilized is taken from the legs so now what is the consequence during the night of having the kidneys receiving more liquid this liquid that was sequestrated from there that the patient start peeing urinating producing more urine at night so now the patient will present okay uh, more urination at night than during the day and this is called nocturia nocturnal urea nocturia yeah it is a manifestation of the reabsorption of the edemas during the night in patients with right heart failure summarizing neck vein distension lower extremities edema or dependent edema yeah uh congestion of the liver um anorexia bloating and nocturia are manifestations of the right heart failure and you can be tested as a select of that apply but what happens when the failure of the pump is predominantly in the left side now the blood should be moving in this direction notice the direction of the or the pointer should be moving in this direction is this movement is delayed so now the traffic jam the problem is here is here. sorry let me change the color the traffic jam is here at the level of the left heart so now the accident is here so the traffic jam is going to build backwards okay the traffic jam is going to be built up here and which is the organ that is uh, is suffering the consequences of this traffic jam the lungs so now the blood that is a liquid the blood is a liquid tissue uh, has a lot of water is building up in the lungs in the circulation in the capillaries of the lungs and the consequence of having this excess of liquid this excess of um, of of blood building up in the in the capillary the consequence is that some of this liquid is moving from the capillaries when it is in excess to the alveoli so now the alveoli can become flooded by some liquid in in higher or lower amounts depending on the severity or the left heart failure but the the alveoli are going to be flooded with liquid and this is called pulmonary edema the pulmonary edema can be you know mild moderate or severe what is the consequence of having liquid inside the alveoli well the main consequence is that the gas exchange this movement of oxygen from the alveoli to the to the to the blood you know this oxygenation of the blood is partially impaired and what is the consequence of having this partially impaired okay on um, oxygenation of the blood that the amount of oxygen in the blood that is coming here to the left heart is decreased so the oxygen decreases why because the alveoli are flooded okay are flooded and we are not fishes we don't we cannot breathe uh we can obtain oxygen from the water you know so now there is a drop in the oxygenation of course the brain the brain will detect that the amount of oxygen in the blood is decreased so the patient will experience the brain the brain will produce the sensation of hunger for air 
the sensation of the oxygen is low. This sensation, this awareness that the amount of oxygen in your body, in your, in your blood and in your brain is low, produces the sensation of dyspnea. So what is dyspnea? This conscious sensation, awareness that you are short of oxygen, short of air, short of respiration. So the consequence is the patient to compensate and start breathing faster, breathing deeper, breathing, you know, start hyperventilating. Because the sensation that the oxygen is enough. Remember that this patient can, yes, hyperventilate. This person has no problems in the respiratory center, has no weakness of the muscle for the respiration, has no obstruction of the airway, has no disease in the lung. The problem is liquid in the lungs as a consequence of the less heart failure. And then the patient have low oxygen as a consequence will increase the respiratory rate, will present a more uh, labored respiration. And one thing that you see in this patient is that the patient immediately, if the patient is, is on bed, is recommend, will sit, the patient will sit. While the patient immediately sits, okay? Because now the lungs, the lungs will move the liquid in the lungs to the lower part of the lungs, leaving the superior part of the lung free of liquid. If the patient is, is, is stays, is stays recumbent, Okay, the lungs will be flooded with liquid in all its extension, no? in all its extension. And then the lungs are not going to be used to breathe, which is, you know, is unacceptable. And the level of oxygen will, will be extremely low. So what is doing the patient? The patient is going to sit. And now I'll, when the patient sits, the liquid goes down, goes down to the lower part of the lungs, leaving this upper part of the lung free. To, to, to breathe. This intolerance to the flat position, to the lying down position, to the recumbent position is called orthopnea. So the dyspnea, specifically, specifically the orthopnea, the orthopnea is a manifestation of left heart failure because of this explanation. And then when you auscultate the lungs, you are going to here, when the air is entering, when the air is entering through the trachea and the bronchi and arrive to the alveoli, when the air arrives to the alveoli, the air that is entering will find in the alveoli what? Water, liquid. And when the air combines with liquid, makes a sound. You know that. You know the sounds of the air and the liquid shaking, yeah? When the air arrives here, it's going to crash with the liquid and will produce a sound. This sound can be auscultated, and those sounds are called crackles, rails of or crackles. Yes. So this is another manifestation, okay, of the presence of the liquid in the lungs because the left heart failure. Those crackles are going to be heard mainly in the lower part of the lungs because remember the patient is not idiot. The patient will try to sit to lower the liquid to the lower part of the lungs. Sometimes when there is too much of this liquid in the alveoli, the patient starts coughing. So cough could be a manifestation of this heart failure, left heart failure. And sometimes when there is too much liquid, when the pulmonary edema is severe, the patient can expel, can, can, can expectorate some of this liquid. This is a liquid that comes from the blood. The liquid of blood is called plasma. This liquid has proteins, and for that reason, when the liquid is uh, is is shaken uh, with the air that is entering, forms a froth, forms a foam, and then the sputum is frothy, is 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 foamy. It's characteristic when it's coming from the alveoli because it's a mixture of the air that should be in the alveoli normally plus the liquid that is abnormally present in the alveoli. But some red blood cells from the blood can also pass to the alveoli. And that's why there is a, a, a pink coloration, a pink coloration in this sputum that the patient is able to expectorate when there is a significant, important pulmonary edema. So when you see this um, a, a statement in question, the pink 
fluffy sputum. Okay, you say, oh, this is equivalent of pulmonary edema. Okay, in the in it's the first to rule out pulmonary edema. Definitely. So the main manifestations of the left heart failures are going to be in the lungs, but don't forget that the uh, role, the work of the left heart is to move the blood in this direction, in the direction of this arrow, to be sent to all the body, to be sent to where? To the brain, to be sent, for example, to the muscles, to be sent, for example, to the kidneys. Don't forget that I told you that the renal arteries are direct branches, okay? And the kidneys are continuously receiving a big volume, a big volume of blood from the left heart. And the amount of urine, the amount of urine that is produced in the kidneys is proportionally uh, proportional and dependent of the amount of liquid that the left heart is sending to the kidneys. So you produce more urine, which is a liquid, depending on how much liquid is moving the, the, the left heart to the, to the kidneys. But now the left heart is failing, cannot move to, uh, enough liquid, cannot move enough liquid to the kidneys. So in left heart failure, if, if not enough amount of liquid is moved to the kidneys, what do you expect to happen with the urinary output to increase or to decrease? To decrease. Because less liquid, less liquid is moved to the kidneys, so less urine is produced. So a decrease production of urine is a manifestation of the left heart failure. Of course, if you pee less urine, than the amount that you should be peeing, you retain this water, you retain this liquid in your body. So now you see the connection between left and right, because in the real life, even if NCLEX ask you to discriminate, to tell apart, to tell apart the symptoms that are related with the right part of the heart and the symptoms related with the left part of the heart, in the real life, you have both sides failing. So you have the same time in the patient symptoms of the right heart failure and symptoms of the left heart failure, because at the end, heart is only one. And when heart is harm, is damaged, usually is, is damaged both parts. Could predominate one part over the other, but both parts are damaged. So now the patient is retaining fluid and is going to have more edema which is a manifestation of right heart failure. So now you understand the interconnection between the two hearts. It's important to know that when a person receives treatment for the heart failure and the left heart, the left heart improve, will pump, will send more liquid to the kidneys. And one manifestation of improvement, uh, response to the treatment uh, uh, of the heart failure is that the patient start peeing more. So because more liquid, more liquid is arriving to the kidneys because the heart failure is improving, okay, with the treatment, then the urinary output will increase. And it's an endless question. What manifestation tells you that the treatment of the heart failure is effective? And then the answer is, the urinary output increases because more liquid is pumped because the fun pump function is improving with the treatment. More liquid is pumped toward the kidneys and the kidneys are able to produce more urine, especially to eliminate the excess of fluid that previously was retained. So those are okay uh, understandings uh, of the pathophysiology of the heart failure, understanding previously the anatomy and the function. Anyway, I have here a table that compared manifestation of the right side and manifestation of the left side. So dependent edema, that is the edema of the part of the body that is, is the lowest position in usually the lower extremities is a manifestation, congestive hepatomegaly, 
okay, that I mentioned is enlargement of the liver uh, uh, pulling blood there because the failure of the right heart to move the blood in the direction of the lungs. As sides can be present, okay, because there is a spillage of liquid in the abdominal cavity, the neck vein distension, the gain of the weight. So you know when you have edema, the water, the liquid that you are retaining has a weight, has a mass and has a weight. So you know that you are going to increase weight when you retain liquid. And you need to remember that each kilogram, each kilogram, each one kilogram of uh, that you gain, it, each kilogram, which is by the way, 2.2 pounds, okay? Pound, okay, equals one liter, one liter of liquid. Okay, so if 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 from today until tomorrow, I increase my weight in two kilos, it because I'm retaining in my body two liters, two quarts, two liters of liquid, and it is the best way, weighing the patient frequently, preferably daily the best way of knowing if a person is retaining or losing liquid. If I start taking a diuretic, maybe tomorrow I have two kilos less. You say, oh, good diet. No, it's not diet. You are not losing fat. You are losing liquid. Do you understand? Because these are uh, uh, bloating, these um, fullness in the abdomen by the liquid and the hepatomegaly, you have anorexia and even right upper quadrant pain, and you have nocturia, nocturnal urea. You pee more frequently at night than during the day because during the day you sequestrate, you trap, you maintain, you pull the liquid, the excess of liquid, the edema in the legs. This liquid is not participating in the circulation, and for that reason, this liquid cannot reach the kidneys. But at night, when you elevate the legs, when you elevate the legs, the liquid will move to the back of the climb, but also will reab be reabsorbed and will end in the kidneys, uh, producing more urinary output. So, moral, the edema of the legs is not very dependable to evaluate the response to the treatment. This is another question in NCLEX. You have a patient that uh, in started treatment of heart failure, started, for example, diuretics. Which one is better to know if the treatment is working? That you notice that the edema in the legs is decreasing, or if you notice that the weight is decreasing, of course, you know that the answer is the weight. Why? Because the edema in the legs can decrease because you just elevated the legs. It doesn't mean that you are getting rid of the extra liquid. In that case, you are moving the extra liquid from the legs to the back, okay? Which is not necessarily getting rid of this liquid. But if you lose weight because you really actually, okay, in reality, is uh, you know are losing this liquid the manifestation of the heart failure are the dyspnea this dyspnea can be when you exercise okay is 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 effort dyspnea okay but even can be at rest especially the orthopnea because you don't tolerate the flat position there is something that can happen okay when you have the heart failure it's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea is here is the name paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea what means that that the person has dyspnea but then when go to bed okay because has dyspnea but also swollen legs because i say this is global this is affects both sides and then the person has left heart failure but also has edema and then at night go to bed and elevate the swollen legs okay elevate the swollen legs okay with pillows at night no at night and then suppose that is sleeping with two pillows and then uh after several hours of being sleeping this liquid is moving in this direction and part of this liquid is reabsorbed and part of this liquid is going to be added to the circulation making worse the pulmonary edema so now the patient wakes up suddenly paroxysmal means sudden acutely sudden okay suddenly wakes up with a lot of dyspnea 
and need to sit on bed, need to sit on bed. It is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, a phenomenon that happens at night, okay, at night after several hours of being sleeping because the reabsorption of the edema of the lower extremities overload of fluids the lungs. Of course, you have the um, the crackles, you have the cough, the, the pink frothy sputum. Uh, you can have fatigue and confusion because the failure of the left heart in, in, in its function of pumping blood to the brain, confusion, muscle fatigue, you know, the failure of the oxygenation of those organs produces the fatigue and the confusion. We study in assessment that the presence of an S3 gallop translates in heart failure. And you know that the production of urine will be decreased in left heart failure because less volume of, uh, of liquid is pumped to the renal arteries. If the patient receives treatment and the left heart failure improves, then you'll see the increased increment of the production of urine. There is a blood test, a blood test that you need to know is called BNP, that stands for b natriuretic peptide. This is a substance produced by the own heart when there is heart failure. When the walls of the heart are stretched in heart failure, the own heart produces this substance. So this substance is elevated in blood because the heart produces this substance when there is heart failure. So a normal person should have a very low BMP because this person is not in heart failure. A normal person has no heart failure, is not having a stretching of the heart. So the level of BMP is low. But if a person is having heart failure and the heart is enlarged and stretched, then is going to have increased level of the BMP. You know that when there is a right heart failure, there is elevation of the central venous pressure, and uh, doctors can measure more sophisticated pressures in the pulmonary arteries, in the branches of the pulmonary artery that is called the wedge pressure or capillary pulmonary wedge pressure that is also elevated. And what is the treatment that you expect in a person with heart failure? Well, don't forget, elevate the head of the bed. It's a nursing intervention. You don't, you don't need to ask for permission to the doctor to do, in, to do that. It's an independent nursing intervention. And why you elevate the head of the bed? I explain the edema of the lungs is going to be a, a move downward and the patient will breathe much better. Okay. If the auto saturation of the client that we have studied, the auto saturation is low, you know, you add oxygen and then doctor will confirm this decision. But then you anticipate that fluid restriction is frequently ordered to patients with heart failure because they have fluid volume excess. And this is also a nursing uh, business because it's the nurse, the one that is going to educate the client in the need of controlling the volume and measuring the amount of liquid that is consumed. And this is calculated and then is strictly okay delivered to the client. And then, for example, they can ask you, a patient that has heart failure, do you remove the traditional, usual uh, water pitcher, okay, the pitcher of water that is used in the room? And the answer is yes. Because if you have a person in fluid restriction, do you leave a pitcher of water with ice provocative, okay, a, a temptation, okay, tempting the client to drink liquid. Of course, you don't do that on the, unless you are a sadistic, okay, nurse, no? So you remove that from the room. And this is a nursing independent nursing intervention, yes. And this is tested in English, yes. So you need to know that one of the interventions, the nursing intervention in patients that have fluid restriction that is not exclusively patient with heart failure, there are other situations like patients with renal failure, patients that have syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, too much antidiuretic hormone and water intoxication, et cetera, hyponatremia, et cetera, et cetera, you are supposed to remove from the room the uh, water picture that you have in the room. Uh, a diet low in sodium, but because those patients generally are receiving pota um, diuretics and are receiving um, dioxin, it's recommended to have a, a, a 
diet rich in potassium, high in potassium. And you should know what is rich in potassium, what what food, what uh, what uh, in, uh, nutrients uh, contain potassium in, in abundance. Sometimes doctors also add a potassium supplementation in the form of liquid or tablets. It's important to weigh the clients daily. It is an independent nursing intervention because it's the best way of knowing if the person is retaining or losing fluids. And you know the equivalence of the weight and the volume of the, of the liquid. And then you anticipate that the doctors is the collaborative intervention will prescribe diuretics, usually loop diuretics. Okay, you know that furosemide, bumetanide, and torsemide. So uh, furo, furo, okay, bumeta, and torse, okay, mite. Okay, furose, furose, furose mite, bumeta night, okay, torse mite, okay, are loop diuretics, you know, and uh, all the all all them could be prescribed. Why they prescribe it? Because are the most potent, they're the high ceiling diuretics, and you need a potent improvement of those clients. Is the cornerstone of the treatment of the of the heart failure the diuretics. You need to know that this type of diuretics will lower sodium and will lower potassium from the body of the person. The decreased sodium is desired, but the decreased potassium could be a adverse effect. And then they can ask you in English, they can put you uh, or they can mention that in the EKG electrocardiograms, no? Uh, there is a U wave, and you need to know that when there is an U wave in the EKG, is a manifestation, is an electrocardiographic manifestation of hypokalemia. And then they can ask you which of the following medications, okay, uh, could be a cause of this alteration, and they give you torsemide, uh, they give you uh, pregnison. They give you lisinopril, another model, okay? And then you need to, to select the torsemide because it's the diuretic. See, this is the way that you apply this knowledge in English because you need to have the knowledge, yes, okay, but then you need to apply that in English. Also, you anticipate that doctor will prescribe vasodilators to decrease the afterload of the heart. And the preferred vasodilator, the one that have provided the best, you know, uh, outcomes are the ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are, um, you know, very good because also help increasing the potassium, no? so it's are going to, to compensate the loss of potassium. And ACE inhibitors have demonstrated an improvement of the heart failure sint symptoms and survival of heart failure. Doctors know that patients with heart failure have tendency to have cardiac dysrhythmias and have sudden death for that reason. They discovered that using very low doses of beta blockers, they can decrease this problem of sudden death and cardiac dysrhythmia. And dioxin is a medication that could be prescribed for heart failure because it um, increases the contractility of the muscle of the heart. The mechanism of action specifically is, is increasing the amount of calcium inside the muscle cells, which enhance the contraction. Indirectly, this is made because the dioxin inhibits the sodium potassium pump. Dioxin is a medication very toxic. So the main role of the nurse with dioxin is to detect toxicity. That's why the nurse needs to ask for appetite, for nausea and vomit, which is an early manifestation, visual disturbances, and should count the heart rate, preferably apical counting of the heart rate or apical pulse before giving the dose of dioxin. Okay. And you can integrate all the stuff that you have studied before, okay, uh, in pharmacology to questions related with the heart failure and the treatment of heart failure. Also, you need to have, because could be tested, an idea of what happens in pediatrics when a child has a 
defective heart is a congenital defect in the heart. You don't need to know in detail the difference and complicated alteration of the heart because you are nurses, you are not cardiologists, you are not embry embryologists. Okay, so keep it, keep it at your level. But you need to know that a child can be born with uh, abnormality, a structural abnormality in the heart. Some and the, mo the, mo the, the, the most frequent don't, do not produce cyanosis. Some, the minority, can produce cyanosis. You need to know that. The most common don't produce cyanosis. The most common are holes, abnormal holes or defects in the walls that separate the right heart from the left heart. So you have atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, and persistent ductus arteriosus that are abnormal communications between the left and the right heart that shouldn't exist. You don't need to know that in detail. But what you know that it is going to produce problems in the normal circulation of the heart, in the normal circulation in the lungs. So when you have these kind of, of defects, is a child, in that case, are childs that are born without cyanosis, no cyanosis, no cyanosis. And they look normal. They look normal, totally normal. And mm, a lot of time, a lot of, in a lot of opportunities, no, 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 no rare that that's happening. The problem is not detected and you need to have in mind. And a nurse, a nurse could detect the problem in that case. So when the, the defect, which is, 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 is mild, is, is, is not significant, is not detected later a nurse can suspect that is a problem in the heart. And NCLEX presents this scenario when a nurse is the one that is suspecting there is an abnormality in the heart of the baby, the newborn, or the infant. Yeah. And how can this present? Okay, when a baby has this defect in the heart, okay, you can auscultate a murmur. A murmur could be auscultated, okay? But it's not the most, uh, you know, the most significant, yes? Uh, but then you'll notice that the baby presents in certain moments manifestations of heart failure, failure of the pump uh, uh, when moving the blood in the direction of the arrows that we discuss, and then the baby can present congestion in the lungs. Okay, uh, accumulation of fluids in the lungs. Okay, a mild or moderate accumulation of fluids in the lungs. This accumulation of the fluids in the lungs, this excess of fluids in the lungs, this uh, mild, moderate pulmonary edema, can be detected when the baby is doing an exercise, a physical exercise and you say babies don't do exercise baby don't go don't go to the gym or or or, or, or climb stairs yes but babies suck <laughs> don't mal don't misinterpret that baby can suck okay and sucking uh, milk especially when there are breastfed is an important significant physical effort for the babies so you can notice Okay, the manifestation of shortness of breath. Okay, this uh, this labor respiration, this shortness of breath, uh, can be noticed when the baby is breastfeeding or even bottle feeding, because they need to suck, and it implies a physical effort. Also, babies um, exercise when they are crying. Okay, when they are crying, also it represents okay a, a physical effort. But the problem is when they are sucking, when they are feeding. A baby that is feeding and presents dyspnea, presents shortness of breath while feeding, will interrupt the feeding. Because when you put in a decision, breathing versus feeding, you prefer breathing. And the problem is that this baby with this little problem that has not been detected, 
each time is feeding will interrupt, will stop feeding before being full, before completing okay, the feeding. So the mother is going to comment, my baby, when is feeding, starts presenting shortness of breath and stops feeding. Okay, classically is going to be also sweating. The baby sweat a lot. Okay, in in the, in the forehead and uh, is sweating and stop the feeding. But then after half an hour, because the baby interrupted the feeding, the baby falls asleep. Babies are sleeping all the time. The baby wakes up again hungry and then wants to feed again. So this frequent feeding, this frequent feeding, but interrupted when the baby doesn't uh, you know, uh, complete the feeding and 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 get full, and be be always hungry, is a common uh, complaint of the mother. Of course, those babies will have growth retardation. Why? Because they are not uh, feeding complete, so are going to have delayed in in the weight gain, and are going to to have some level of growth retardation. Uh, by the way, later we'll study endocarditis. Those babies with abnormal holes in the in the heart that are born with this malformation need to be um, prevented. Uh, 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 need to have prevented, okay, the development of endocarditis, and you need to think of the possibility of developing endocarditis. There is a variation of uh, congenital heart disease in which in which the baby is born with cyanosis. It's called tetralogy of Fallot. This is what you need to know. It's called tetralogy because it has four defects in the same, uh, at the same time. You don't need to know in detail those defects. Don't complicate it. Go to nursing, not to medicine, okay? And uh, in this tetralogy of Fallot, the baby will be all time cyanotic will have central cyanosis you differentiate the central cyanosis which is the one that you see in a tetralifalot because the lips and the mucosa is cyanotic babies normally have cyanosis in the in the hands and feet it's called acro cyanosis it is not central cyanosis this is not problem the bad cyanosis is the cyanosis that you know that implies the lips and the mucosa yeah, a part of the extremities, okay? And uh, they are born with central cyanosis, with central cyanosis. And, um, and but they become, okay, and all the manifestation of heart failure that we describe here, the same, the same problem that you describe here. But then this cyanosis in some moments becomes more intense. And that's are called cyanotic spells. So the baby is cyanotic, but in some moments becomes more cyanotic and feel very bad because it's too cyanotic. If the baby is allowed to grow like this girl that you see here, yeah, with obviously the of a lot, has been, usually they are they have surgery, uh, you know, one day, before the year to correct in several steps, the defects. But this girl was being left without surgery, okay, obviously. And then you'll see that this girl, when she is running, she's smart, for the rest is normal. The only thing is the discoloration that she has in the lips and in the nails. I know that the picture is too small, but those nails looks abnormal, looks like like, like, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, like with nail, a purple nail polish, okay? And you notice that the nails are like different, and this is called clubbing. When you have a, a client that have cyanosis all the time, has chronic cyanosis, like a client with a long chronic lung disease, like a COPD or cystic fibrosis, yes? They have a chronic, chronic is years, you know? A uh, uh, long disease, you see clubbing, but also when you have a child that has been growing, okay, like that this girl with a chronic cyanosis because the tetralogy followed, they develop clubbing, 
Another thing that you notice on them is that hemoglobin is very high. It is a compensation due to the cyanosis, due to the, the decreased capacity of transportation, no capacity of transportation. Let me see, the, 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 due to the decreased amount of oxygen in the blood, the body will compensate producing more, more hemoglobin. And when you have this high volume of red blood cells called polycythemia, polycythemia, very well. So you see that this girl that has chronic cyanosis, maybe is a small for her, uh, for her age, has, um, como se llama, um, how you call this, um, clubbing, yeah? You see that in certain moments when she is running, when she's playing, yeah? girls, babies, um, children play, you know? uh, 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 they are running, yes? then they become very cyanotic. So she has a cyanotic spell. And you see that she adopts this position. This position is called squatting. Yes, she squats. What she is doing, she is doing this position. Yes, squatting. Okay. So this is the trunk, this is the leg. This position will decrease momentarily, transi transient, will decrease the blood return to the heart. The blue blood, the blood not oxygenated, the blood return, the venous blood return is, is uh, for some moments in this position, transiently decrease. So the the blue blood, the blood without oxygen that returns through the inferior vena cava is going to decrease in this position because the compression of the inferior vena cava during adopting this position. And now less blue blood will arrive to the heart and less blue blood will be pumped to the, to the lips, to the brain and to the body. So the cyanosis will improve. The, the the blue color will decrease, yes? And the cyanosis will improve in this position. That's why it's okay to allow and to respect this squatting position of the children when they suffer of the tragedy of a lot and have a cyanotic spell, because this position will decrease and improve, okay, the cyanotic spell. But if you have an infant, no, a, a child, an infant, yes, that cannot squat because they don't walk, is the nurse, is the mother, the one need to be taught to place the infant in this squatting position. And the way of doing that is making the baby upright, okay, to placing the baby upright and moving the knees toward the chest, yes, moving the knees toward the chest. And you are doing that with your hands, okay? With your hands, okay? Holding the baby, okay? Holding the baby and moving the uh, the knees. It's a knee chest position, okay? And this is a common, a common question in your ankles if you understand that this position will improve uh, that. Also, they can ask you about if you know the the findings in a child with this um, manifestation of your study there. Kawasaki disease is mentioned in cardiovascular because in, in the pediatric component of cardiovascular because can affect the heart. The main problem with the Kawasaki disease is that can affect the heart in children. We don't know why this disease occurs. We know that it's autoimmune. It's an autoimmune disease. So abnormal immunity for unknown reasons is produced in certain moments in a previously totally normal child. Usually it's small children, more frequently in males than in females. The initial manifestations are basically fever, a lot of fever, but the fever has a rash. This rash helps the doctor suspect the disease is a rash that affects a lot of the, the hands, the fingers, and is a rash that produces a strawberry tomb. And there are tests that allow to confirm that it's a Kawasaki disease. Uh, if this disease is not properly treated, evolve and to a chronic condition in which the heart is affected. That's the importance of the 
correct recognition and diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. It is going to be mainly the role of the physician. So uh, it's not usual, okay? Nurses being the responsible of diagnosing Kawasaki disease. So don't expect a question about the signs and symptoms because it's not, it's not the kind of disease that we nurses should be uh, uh, diagnosing. It's, it's more responsibility of the physician. But you need to be knowledgeable about the treatment of Kawasaki disease because the, the, the cornerstone of the treatment of Kawasaki disease is the use of high doses of aspirin. Aspirin are not supposed to be given to children with fever, but you need, because you know they can produce the Reyes syndrome, yes? Okay, the Reyes syndrome, the Reyes syndrome, okay, is when a child with uh, uh, flu influenza or varicella, chicken pox, that are diseases that produce fever, consume aspirin because uh, People in the street, parents, lay people, okay, don't know if the child has fever because of flu or because of varicella. It's better to teach lay people, hey, don't give aspirin to your children when they have fever, because it could be uh, flu, could be influenza, or could be um, varicella, the initial stages of the varicella before the rush. And then if you give aspirin, it can produce a very severe inflammation of the brain and the liver, okay, called Ray syndrome, that is no good. So it is okay. But doctors know that when a child with Kawasaki has fever, it is not varicella, it is not flu, it is Kawasaki. And then they know that they can use the aspirin. They have tests that verify there is Kawasaki and they can use the aspirin. So high doses of aspirins are used in patients with Kawasaki disease, even being children with fever, because it's okay to use aspirin is the treatment of the Kawasaki disease, okay? And have that in mind, have that in mind. The uh, other aspects, well, high doses of aspirin brings the possibility of toxicity by aspirin. So it could be a scenario, to discuss the toxicity of aspirin. You know what is toxicity? When we have too much of something, no? And in that case, because the patient will need high doses of aspirin, there is a possibility that the patient developed aspirin toxicity. You know that the early, early manifestation could be uh, otics, so the patient can have tinnitus, but then the aspirin stimulates directly the respiratory center producing hyperventilation. So now because the hyperventilation. Oh, okay, oh, okay, just scare me. Uh, because the hyperventilation, the patient in initially will have respiratory alkalosis. But then being the high doses of aspirin, the toxicity of aspirin and acetyl salicylic acid, no? Acetyl salicylic acid, um, uh, an acid will also plus the, the the collapse that can produce in the in the shot, then the person will start presenting metabolic acidosis. So at the same time, you have a mixed acid-base balance when initially is a respiratory alkalosis and then is added a metabolic acidosis. Uh, uh, and then uh, you can have, okay, a collapse of the client, okay, with hypotension, with a, a catastrophic, okay, consequences. Uh, the other important topic that could be tested in Kawasaki disease is that a part of the aspirin Kawasaki disease requires the administration of immune globulins. Immune globulins are antibodies. So the patient will receive intravenous antibodies. Uh, Kawasaki disease is an autoimmune disease, so they are bad antibodies. Okay, they give antibodies against the bad antibodies. That's it. Simplify. So they receive IB immune globulins. Immune globulins is the same as antibodies. This has two practical applications 
to practical applications in, in nursing. You have a child, a child convalescent of Kawasaki disease taking aspirin, taking aspirin. And the child has due the vaccination of influenza flu that is given every year and or has due the vaccination of varicella, chickenpox, yes, that is given after one year of age and is repeating again when the child is four or five years. Can those vaccines given while the child is taking aspirin? The answer is no, because can produce the Ray syndrome. So a child never should take aspirin while suffering of a fever related with influenza, flu, or varicella, but should not receive the, 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 the should not be taking aspirin when receiving the vaccine against the same flu and varicella. So there is incompatibility in children uh, of aspirin with the actual disease, flu or varicella, or the vaccination for flu or varicella. You need to know that. So what needs to be done with those vaccinations need to be postponed, okay? Poster gate should be uh, in, um, it get postponed when the child is not taking aspirin anymore. No problem. Uh, if you don't understand what I'm explaining, you ask me to explain. It's a common question. The other situation also related with the vaccine. The child is receiving antibodies, immune globulins. Those are general, non-specific immune globulins, okay? Those immune globulins include antibodies that destroy or protect the virus of the uh, mumps, measles, rubella, and varicella. Yes? So when a child is injected with this immune globulin, has in the body antibodies against measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella. The live virus vaccines that are the MMR and varicella cannot be given when a child is receiving IV immune globulin because then the vaccine is going to be destroyed by those antibodies. And the child should wait, okay, many months. They recommend nine to 12 months, almost a year, okay, to receive the vaccination because the presence of those antibodies given because the Kawasaki disease will um, inactivate the vaccination. This topic is frequently in English. This topic is frequently related with Kawasaki disease. So are more related with the practical application, more related with nursing than the diagnose or the treatment of the Kawasaki disease. Is understood? Okay. Yes, wonderful. Okay, wonderful. I'm trying to transmit to you my experience with the type of questions that um, have been in English because they consider are important to be known by a nurse. And all the disease that affect the heart, and by the way, more frequently is seen in children and young people, is the rheumatic fever. It is a disease of pediatrics and adolescents and young adults, generally people that younger than 20, 20 21, yes? Uh, it's called rheumatic fever. It's called fever because has fever. <laughs> it's called rheumatic because produces inflammation of the joint. But this is not the problem. Neither the fever or the or the inflammation of the joints will leave important, you know, consequences. Okay, to the to the to the client is the heart, the one that can be harmed, can be damaged by this condition. Uh, specifically, the valve of the left side of the heart. I mean the mitral and the aortic valve can be seriously damaged by this disease as a consequence of the disease. So um, what is the rheumatic fever? Is another 
uh, autoimmune phenomenon is another in this case considered hypersensitivity okay in which when a person a young person has a streptococcal infection of the throat so a tonsillitis you know, a strep throat yeah the common strep throat this strep throat can trigger the production of abnormal immunity that can attack the heart producing inflammation on the heart and damage of the valve of the heart a part of that a part of that is going to produce fever those antibodies will produce fever produce inflammation of the joints even can produce abnormalities in the nervous system producing abnormal movement but all this stuff is going to be self-limited are not going to give consequences even without treatment will disappear but you are going to leave the heart damage these antibodies that also attack the heart can leave the valve of the heart damage and this is what you need to understand of rheumatic fever the rheumatic fever presents weeks after the person had the strep throat so in the moment of the attack of the rheumatic fever may be the the tonsillitis the the, the strep throat already is absent already subsided already is is over is over uh, there is a test that you need to know because sometimes have been you know if you know this test it's called anti estrectolizing o or abbreviated aso is a blood test is a blood work that tells the nurse and the physician that the person had a stance had recently an streptococcal infection so you expect a patient with rheumatic fever maybe the tonsils are okay but if you do the blood test the aso you'll find that this person recently had an strep throat an streptococcal infection and this is important is tested have been tested uh the person that has acute rheumatic fever is having that is also treated with high doses of aspirin with the same implication that I mentioned before about high doses of aspirin toxicity tinnitus mixed acid based disbalance okay um, respiratory alkalosis combined with metabolic acidosis and could be event okay severe can produce shock and collapse and the other is that those patients if they are children uh, you know cannot receive um cannot receive the vaccination for the flu or varicella because they can develop a rise syndrome a rise syndrome okay very well it is the most important about rheumatic fever bacterial endocarditis sometimes the interior of the heart can become infected and this is called bacterial endocarditis and it's catastrophic it's catastrophic because having a bacteria colonizing infecting the lining the interior of the heart in one side can damage the interior of the heart and what is in the interior of the heart are mainly the valve especially the mitral and aortic valve so the valve can be damaged by the bacterial endocarditis but a part of that you have a septicemia you have a sepsis because you have the heart is pumping blood to all the body and you have bacteria inside the heart so the heart is pumping those bacteria all over the body it's curious that when you have this infection inside the heart the heart forms and some type of clots inside the heart called vegetation are made by fibrin but those clots inside the heart that are visible and microscopic uh, can be seen uh, have bacteria and pieces fragments of those clots of those masses of fibrin with bacteria are going to be pumped by the heart all over the body to the brain to the skin to the kidneys to the liver to whatever no even the live the, the, the driver license of the clients is going to have embolization of this stuff do you imagine the severity of the condition that you have embolizations 
all over your body, to your brain, to your liver, to the kidney, all over your body. And those embolos have bacteria. Those embolos are part of produce infarctions, a part of produce embolizations, are going to produce infection in the distal organs. And then you can have abscesses in the brain. You can have you know, meningitis. You can have abscesses in the liver, abscesses in the kidneys, abscesses in everywhere until there is a moment that the severity of the of, and, and the magnitude of the infection, the infection producing this um, reaction in the body, the production of antibodies, uh, activation of the immunity and activation of the cytokines, etc., will overwhelm the body and the patient dies in a septic shock. Uh, there is a risk factor. There are risk factors to develop bacterial endocarditis. And two of the most important risk factors that you need to know are A, having a previous past many years even damage in the bowel. For example, a person who had a rheumatic fever in the childhood is left with a damage in one of the valves, supposing the mitral valve, and later they develop infection in this damage, previously damaged valve. So previous damage in the valve predisposed to infections of those valves or being born with one of these uh, congenital abnormal the, the structural stuff in the heart can also predispose the, the person to a infection in these abnormalities of the interior of the heart. But there is another client that has tendency to produce infections inside the heart are the IV drug users. IV drug users in a recurrent way, uh, I mean several times per day, inject in their circulation uh, substances that are not, not clean with syringes that are not necessarily sterile. So this overload of um, a, 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 this high load of bacteria that is injected in the circulation can end infecting the interior of the heart. Those are two risk factors, okay? Previous uh, you know, structural damage of the heart or IV drug users. Um, do you know that those people have murmurs, have a structural uh, alteration in the heart, damaged valve, etc. Uh, when they go to the dentist, when they are going to have a surgery, when they are going to have, I don't know, a biopsy, a curettage, an endoscopy, they receive prophylaxis, preventive, pre to prevent. Prophylaxis is to prevent doses of antibiotics, okay, to prevent the development of infections inside the heart to prevent the development of bacterial endocarditis. Uh, the patient is going to have fever, is going to have evidence of embolization all over the body, so strokes, uh, 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 inflammation in the liver, in the kidney, but in the skin, you can see the embolizations. So you see those red, multiple red dots, that can be sold in the palm, in the fingers, in the soles. See, it's one of those red dots. It's one of these petechia. It's one of those nodules that you see are embolizations in the terminal arterioles or in, 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 in blood vessels of the skin. So if this is happening in the skin, it is happening in the rest of the body, in the internal organs of the client. Is catastrophic, it's, it's terrible. The person will be seriously ill. The heart is going to be a disaster because the valve is damaged by the infection. So now if the patient has a mild damage in the valve, now have a severe damage in the valve with a, a worsening of the murmurs and a, you know, a presence of heart failure because the failure of the pump. And of course, the person will have cultures of the blood positive to the bacteria that is producing the endocarditis. The treatment is antibiotic, of course, if it is diagnosed early enough and for many, many, many weeks. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a, a, a three days of antibiotics, are weeks of antibiotics and intravenous antibiotics, depending on the result of the culture. 
And the other stuff that those patients frequently requires is valve replacement. So the damage of the mitral, the damage of the aortic valve are so severe that need to be replaced. Talking about valve replacement, you need to know that there are two types of uh, replacements okay, of the valve. So the valve of the person is removed and a new one is placed. Valve replacement. There are mechanical valve replacement and biological valve replacement. A mechanical valve replacement is a new valve, but is made with plastic and metals. Do you understand? It's, it's a mechanical valve. Are very good, are functioning very well, are going to last all the life, but then have a defect. They tend to produce clots inside the heart. So this patient that is implanted, to whom is implanted a mechanical valve, will take anticoagulants, warfarin, for the rest of his or her life. But also they can use a live tissue valve. They can take the valve, for example, of a pig. Pig, pig hearts are similar similar size and the structure than human size, uh, uh, hearts. So they can use, for example, a valve, mitral valve of a pig or other animals, but especially the most common is pig, pig valve, okay? And um, these valves are also working very well, but are not going to be uh, as long lasting at the mechanical valve. This is after many years, X number of years, need to be replaced again, okay? Because are going to, to suffer a process of wear and tear because it's, it's live tissue. But have the advantage that they don't produce uh, clots. For that reason, the biological valve replacement don't, uh, uh, doesn't require uh, a, the anticoagulation. And this has been some time tested. So mechanical, yes, anticoagulants, biological, no anticoagulants needed. Then the other part of the heart that can suffer inflammation and problems is the pericardium. You know that the heart is the pump, has muscle, et cetera, et cetera, but is surrounded, is covered by a double membrane. This reminds us the, um, the lung, no? the pleural membrane, but this is called pericardium membrane but it's a double layer. The, there is nothing between the two layers. The two layers of pericardium are very smooth in normal conditions and have a microscopic line, lining or no, lining, no, uh, no uh, layer is the word, layer of liquid. It's a microscopic layer of liquid. These are, uh, layer of liquid lubricates the two uh, um, the two uh, pericardial membranes, the visceral and the parietal. So when the heart contract and relax and makes this move and this sliding of the two layers of the pericardium, there is no friction because they are very smooth and lubricated by this layer of liquid. No sound, no vibration, nothing is heard when the layers of the pericardium slide one over the other in a normal heartbeat, in a normal heart. But when there is inflammation of the pericardium, it's called pericarditis, yes. And this inflammation can have many causes. The most common is a viral virus infection of the pericardium, which is a very benign condition, a very self-limited, easy to resolve condition. Sometimes it's a bacteria. Sometimes it's an autoimmune phenomenon. For example, lupus. Lupus, okay, is a autoimmune disease that love to produce inflammation in the pericardium. Sometimes are toxic substances, for example, uh, BUM, urea, urea uh, can produce 
uremic pericarditis. Sometimes a trauma. Sometimes it's a myocardial infarction. A myocardial infarction, the infarction of the myocardium can extend and produce inflammation in the pericardium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't care about the etiology. But uh, there are many causes of inflammation of the pericardium. When this occurs, it's called pericarditis. The initial response of the inflammation of the pericardium is that the pericardium, this smooth layer, becomes rough, becomes, uh, you know, irregular. So now when the heart beats, when the heart beats and there is contraction and relaxation, the sliding of the one membrane over the other will produce, uh, you know, friction, will produce vibration and can be heard can be heard with the stethoscope. And this friction that has two odd times, systole and diastole, when the heart contracts, there is a sliding and then of the one membrane over the other. And when the heart relaxes, there is another sliding and another sound. So these two times, two, 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 two sounds, okay, um, vibration is called pericardial rough. Pericardial rub, okay. Pericardial rub, okay. R E U B. Pericardial rub, yeah. So when you school the, the the heart, you are going to to hear something like this, uh, you know, uh, a friction, a friction of of something there. No, it's going to have to turn to like. That something that is rough, okay, is sliding one over the other. It's called pericardial rub. This pericardial rub tends to be painful. And the patient experiences pain in the chest, not related with exercise, it's continuous. And an important detail of this pericardial pain of the pericarditis, this chest pain of the pericarditis, is that the client obtains relief leaning forward. So what is the position that you expect to see a patient, okay, a patient that is with a pericarditis or hospitalized and has pericardial rub and has pericardial pain? You are going to see the client in this position. It's going to be on bed, leaning forward, leaning forward with a pillow, Okay, holding, okay, hugging the pillow in this position. So leaning forward, leaning forward. You understand? Leaning forward. If the client is standing, okay, or sitting, you see the client is always leaning forward because with this leaning forward, okay, the patient obtains a relief of the pain. Okay, and close question. Remember that positioning. And those anti pain or antalgic positions is nursing business. It's nursing business. Okay. And uh, this is what happens in the acute pericarditis. Sometimes, sometimes when there is inflammation of the pericardium, the pericardium starts producing exudates, ooze, leak, liquids in the space between the two layers of the pericardium. Now it is called pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion. So you see that liquids start building up around the heart between the two layers of the pericardium. It's called pericardial effusion. When this occurs, this uh, friction, this sliding of one layer of the pericardium over the other, okay, producing the rope, disappear because they separate. Who separates the two layers of the pericardium, the liquid? Because the liquid accumulate between the two layers of the pericardium. So uh, paradoxically, the patient improves the pain and the patient disappears, the pericardial rub. The pericardial rub disappears. But now, when you auscultate the heart, you are going to have difficulty hearing the lap dub, the S1, S2, that should to be hearing in the heart. Why? Because if you have a, a, a cushion, or you have, a, you know, this liquid uh, a cushion around the heart, 
the sounds that produces the valve, this locked dop that produces the valve, this locked dop is produced by the mitral valve when closing, okay? The S1 is produced by the mitral valve closing at the beginning of the systole, and the S2 is produced by the closure of the aortic valve, okay, at the beginning of the diastole. This sound is going to be muffled by the presence of this cushion of liquid around the heart. So when you put the stethoscope here, you are going to have difficulty hearing, okay, the heart sounds, and this is the muffled heart sounds. But then everything is depending on the amount, okay? The size is important here. If the amount of liquid is small, then you only hear muffled heart sound, but the patient is okay. The patient is okay, okay? Because the amount of liquid is small, yeah? You have muffled heart sound. But if the amount of liquid is important, and then you have an important accumulation of liquid, this liquid is going to strangle to squeeze the heart. Squeeze the heart. Understand? And now is when you start the patient becoming no okay. Because what is the problem? The blood, the blue blood that is coming from, from, from the vena cava, the inferior and superior cava, cannot enter. If you have the heart strangled, squeezed by this amount of liquid, the blood cannot enter, can't enter. Doesn't mean that doesn't enter at all, but at least has a lot of difficulty to enter. Okay? It's like you 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 are going to a city where the, there is a rush hour, important rush hour, and the bus are coming full. You're trying to enter to the bus, but you cannot enter because it's full. There is no way of, of penetrating in the bus because it's full, especially in certain countries. Okay, some of you know what I'm saying. Okay, it's full. You cannot enter. So what is going to happen with the neck vein is the blood through the supina cava cannot enter. It's going to be very distended. Neck vein distension is one of the manifestations of this hemodynamic complication when the patient has so much liquid spill that is no okay, is critically ill. But if the blood is not entering, can the blood leave through the aorta? Obviously no. The blood that enters the heart is the blood that later leaves the aorta. And if you have less blood uh, leaving the aorta, what do you anticipate happening with the heart rate, uh, pardon, with the blood pressure is going to drop. It's going to drop. The blood pressure is drop. So now you are going to have a combination of a patient that is not okay, a patient that looks very sick, that has the muffled heart sounds has the neck vein distension and hypotension and can reach the level of shock. What is shock? A blood pressure that is too low, too low, so low that the blood is not moving. So there is no transportation of oxygen. If the blood is not moving, it's not transporting oxygen from the lungs to the tissues. And now the tissues start dying because they are not receiving oxygen. And then you have a progressive cascade effect of death of tissues. This is shock. So the patient enters in shock. So when you have this condition, neck vein distension, muffled heart sounds, hypotension, and the patient enters in shock, you have something called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade. And it is an absolute emergency. The liquid should be extracted quickly with a needle. It's, this procedure is called pericardiocentesis. Pericardiocentesis. Okay. When a person has these on, these are uh, pericardial uh, tamponade, something peculiar is going to happen with the radial pulse. When a nurse is palpating the radial pulse of the client, of the client, okay, palpating here the, the, the radial pulse of a client, a nurse, yes, 
is going to notice when the patient breathing suck, no? Breathing, the pulse disappears. You don't feel the pulse or the radial artery. But when the patient breathes out, expel the air, no? Breathe out, the pulse reappears. It is because when the patient breathing, the blood pressure decreases too much significantly to the level that you don't feel the pulse in the radial artery. But when the patient breathe out, the blood pressure recovers, okay, improve, increases, and then you start feeling again the pulse. So either if you feel this phenomenon while palpating the radial pulse, or if you are taking the blood pressure and you notice that the blood pressure drops down, decreases, okay, uh, significantly, okay, during inspiration, there is a significant drop of the systolic blood pressure during inspiration, you say, oh, the patient has another manifestation of cardiac tamponade is called pulsus paradoxus, okay? Pulsus paradoxus, okay? And it is an question. So it's not only the muffled heart sound, it's not only the neck vein distension, it's not only the hypotension and the shock, also the pulsus paradoxus, the manifestation of the um, cardiac tamponade. And the understanding that is a priority, is the patient to, 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 to attend first, Yes, because has obstruction of the blood flow in the heart and is going to develop a obstructive shock. Are we good? Very good. Common question. Another topic that Inclus love is to talk about coronary artery disease. You have two coronary arteries, right and left, that uh, are branches, direct branches with the aorta at the root of the aorta, as I presented, when the aorta leaves the heart, you have the, 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 the beginning uh, of the um, coronary arteries. And those coronary arteries brings the oxygenated blood to the muscle of the heart. Those coronary arteries are very susceptible to the process called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is that the, the arteries of the body are like pipes, okay? And those pipes has a wall and has a lumen, a hole inside, a wall and a lumen, yeah? But there is a tendency in human beings since very young age to accumulate in the walls of the arteries, among those arteries, the coronary arteries, a fat called cholesterol. So this fat gradually along years start accumulating in the walls of the um, of the arteries. And with the pass of the years, okay, this accumulation of fat producing uh, uh, lumps, plaques of cholesterol in the walls of the arteries that narrow, narrow the space through which the blood circulate because the blood needs to circulate here, needs to circulate here, and should be circulating through all the space that naturally is initial. Now, there is a narrow wing, okay, for the blood to circulate. The consequence of this is that the tissues, tissues, okay, the cells that depends of this artery, okay, in certain moments are going to receive less blood and less oxygen, than normal because there is a narrowing by plaques of ateroma of the arteries. It can happen in the brain, it can happen in the heart, it can happen in the lower extremities. Yes? When the cells, when the cells that depend on those arteries that I mentioned are receiving less oxygen than they needed, those cells deviate their metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic. The anaerobic metabolism is abnormal, is in absence or in decreased oxygen. And this uh, metabolism produces a venom, a toxin, a poison called lactic acid. Lactic acid. 
locally in the area of the ischemia when there is less blood flow and less supply of oxygen to tissue is called ischemia yeah in the area of the ischemic tissue that is localized is only one artery only one branch as they produce this ischemia then produce lactic acid lactic acid hurts produces pain so if you have in a part in a piece of your heart Okay, in this part of your heart, you have accumulation of lactic acid will produce pain in your heart. And the heart is in the chest. So usually produces chest pain. Is the production of lactic acid when part of the heart, cells of the hearts are not receiving enough blood with oxygen and then produce lactic acid. This can happen in the legs. The legs can have this partial obstruction in the arteries, and then sometimes in certain circumstances, parts of the legs could not receive, the tissues of the legs could not be receiving enough blood and oxygen and can produce lactic acid, and then the legs are going to hurt, are going to have pain. And it tends to occur when the legs are being used. I mean, when you are uh, walking. And then because the pains, the person needs to stop walking. Until the uh, ischemia disappears and then can walk again. And this tends to repeat. And it's called intermittent claudication. And you need to know what is intermittent claudication. And you need to know that is manifestation of bad arterial circulation because the process of atherosclerosis in the arteries of the legs, which is especially common in diabetic clients and smokers. But this can happen in the heart, producing chest pain. The chest pain is called angina or angina, the way that you want to pronounce that. Also can occur in the arteries that brings the blood to your brain, your wonderful brain. But brain doesn't hurt. Brain has no pain receptors. No matter that it's produced lactic acid in the brain, there are not pain receptors in the brain. So there is no pain in the brain. Nevertheless, brain controls most of your functions. You move things to your brain. You feel thanks to your brain. You speak thanks to your brain. Do whatever thanks to your brain. So when there is ischemia in the brain, there is a portion of the brain that is not receiving enough blood with oxygen, then the brain starts malfunctioning. And this part of the brain could be the part that you use either to move one part of your body or to speak, or to see, etc. And then you can have okay malfunction of your brain. You cannot move one hand, you cannot speak, you cannot see one thing, etc. And this is called transient ischemic attack. This occurs when the obstruction is not total, is partial. As you notice here, you have obstruction, but still you have this space, still you have this space for the blood to flow. When this is partial, the pain in the chest is called angina. When this is partial, the pain in the legs is called intermittent claudication. When this happens in the brain, because there is no pain, it's called transient ischemic attack or TIA. But one day, one day, one bad day, the plaque, this plaque can break. Can, is so big that can break. And then when the plaque breaks, this activates the coagulation locally, the coagulation. And now a clot starts growing here in, in very fast. It starts growing here in the next hours. And the growth of the clot can, can totally obstruct the space. So now, no blood, no blood is going to pass to those tissues. So now those tissues initially will start having pain because they are lactic acid, but then 
because zero blood arrive, those tissues will start dying. Those tissues will start dying. So now when there is death of the tissue, we call this infarction. Necrosis of the tissues, of the tissues is called infarction. So now you have, if it is in the heart, a myocardial infarction. Yes, it translates death of the tissues. If you have in the brain a brain infarction, brain infarct, yes, or stroke, people call that a stroke. Yes, when there is in the leg, you have a gangrene. You understand? Okay, you understand that. That's why those people that have, okay, those plaques, that not those plaques, doctor give those people aspirin to prevent the formation of the clot. Yeah, as an example. Okay, you need to know that there are risk factors. There are risk factors to have this process, this process of formation of plaques of cholesterol uh, sooner than expected. And those risk factors are, for example, gender. Men develop those plaques before women. Yeah. Can be age. As you grow older, those plaques are bigger. And can be genetics. If in some families, some families has the tendency to develop those plaques bigger so and sooner. Yeah. And then you see that in this family, there are a lot of cases of myocardial infarction, strokes, even at relatively younger age. But notice that any of these three factors can be modified. You cannot modify your family, even if you want. Uh, you cannot modify your gender. Your, 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 I don't know how to say that now because now you need to be very careful when you say that. Okay, your biological sex cannot be modified. Okay, okay, and uh, you can modify your gender, I think, but not your biological sex. You cannot modify that, even if you have surgery and hormones, you cannot modify that. And um, and you cannot modify your age, even if you if you try. Okay, that's it. So those are not important, but there are other, other risk factors that can just be modified. For example, obesity, being fat, is a risk factor for suffering early, earlier and more severe. Those this process of atherosclerosis or process of formation of plaque of ateroma. You can modify the obesity. I've been fighting with my obesity all my life. I can, you, you can control your obesity. Uh, hypertension can favor that. You can control your blood pressure. Smoking favors that you can, you know, quit smoking. High cholesterol can favor that you can control your cholesterol. There are medications to control your cholesterol and, and etc. Uh, sedentarism favors that you can control your sedentary. You can start exercising, you know. Uh, diabetes can favor that you can control your diabetes. You can have a, a good control of your diabetes. Okay, so uh, all those are modifiable risk factors for myocardial infarction, for a stroke, for for peripheral arterial disease that can be modified. And uh, there is one condition that anchors love that is a condition that summarizes or gather in one person all many, the majority of those risk factors that is called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is directly related with obesity. So the cause of the metabolic syndrome is basically obesity independently of the cause of the obesity. In this metabolic syndrome, the person is obese. So the body mass index, BMI, is higher than normal. But this obesity is not any obesity. It's a peculiar and probably genetically influenced type of obesity 
that is the central obesity, the obesity that is in the trunk. You know, you have head, neck, extremities, and trunk. So the obesity is, is, is concentrated in the trunk. So for that reason, you have a person, a person that has a very obese trunk, this is the person, and relatively, relatively thin extremities. This is the person, you know? And what defines this central obesity is the circumference, the girth of your waist. Waist is at the level of the navel, at the level of the umbilicus. When you measure your abdominal circumference, your trunk circumference at the level of the navel, at the navel of the belly button, this is the waist, is the waist circumference. And those people have a increased waist circumference. Uh, you don't need to memorize those numbers, but those are the numbers that they suggest. This is to differentiate, okay? This is to differentiate other type of obesities. The, for example, there is a type of people that have this type of obesity. I'm drawing that. This is the person, okay? This is the person. And this person has this type of obesity. This is the umbilicus. So what you notice, a, a big butt, very uh, big uh, thighs and legs, very adipose, yes? But then they have a relative narrow waist. This is called pear because these fruits remind me a pear pear type obesity, while the bad obesity, the obesity that is in the waist is called apple, apple shaped obesity. Okay, all this has been in English. Okay, all these have been in English. Okay, can you recognize people with this type of obesity, with this pear obesity? Okay, a lot, no? Especially people, Hispanic people and African American. And this is this type of obesity is more common, can be seen in, in any gender, but can be is more common in men, no? Okay. La barriga cervecera. See? Okay. okay. So this is this is characteristic of the metabolic syndrome, central obesity. Central obesity. These people okay, tend to have higher than normal blood pressure higher than normal level of insulin and intolerance to the action of the insulin and tendency to develop prediabetes or glucose intolerance. And those people have high triglycerides. You know that in the blood you have two types of fats, triglycerides and cholesterol. And then they have high triglycerides. And the cholesterol more than having high total cholesterol, they have low, it is important, low good cholesterol. Because you know that the cholesterol, you know that, can be associated to certain high density lipoproteins called the good cholesterol, or can be associated with low density lipoproteins, LDL, that is the bad cholesterol. The one that forms, has the tendency to produce those plaques. The HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, don't accumulate here. Don't, do not accumulate here. The one that accumulate here is the LDL cholesterol. This is the bad cholesterol, the one that produces those plaques of ateroma. You understand? And uh, it is, it is important. It is important to know. By the way, another stuff that has been tested in English is that if you know that those people that have the metabolic syndrome has tendency to have this discoloration and thickening of the skin in the neck, in the armpits, and between the legs. And it's called acanthosis nigricans. It's, a, it's, a, it's associated with the metabolic syndrome. It's so sad that nowadays we have epidemics of obesity in children and young people, adolescents. And you see 
this scenario in young people. And you are very sad because you know that those children and those young people are going to have a very early myocardial infarction or very early a stroke, very early diabetes, very early hypertension. And it's sad to have a child that is already sick. You know, is already sickened by the obesity and adolescent that is already sickened by the obesity. Uh, what we can recommend, well, uh, keep a normal weight, do exercise, don't smoke, control your blood pressure, control your cholesterol or triglycerides. It's very important to recommend the patient a diet, a healthy diet. Healthy diets are diet that prevents the development of plaque of atheroma. The healthy diet is low in saturated fats. The saturated fats are the fats that promote the atherosclerosis. The fats that are saturated come from animals. What is an animal? It's a cow. So the cow gives us the beef. This beef has a lot of cholesterol, a lot of but fat, saturated fats, and give all us the milk. The milk has a lot of saturated fats. What we can do with the milk, we can remove the fat from the milk. So it's called skim milk or 1% milk, okay, that have removed low fat content dairy. This is acceptable. This is good. But the whole milk and the full fat, okay, cheese, sour cream, etc., are not good because contain too much saturated fats. What other, um, okay, we have <clears throat> better fats are called mono uh, unsaturated or poly unsaturated in contrast with saturated. Where you find those fats, those good fats? Okay, generally you find that in certain vegetables, like the peanuts, tree nuts. You find that in, in uh, olive, the olive oil, okay? And in certain, okay, other vegetables, okay? To make it simple. But also you find those fats in fruits like avocado, yeah? And you find those fats also in fish. Many fishes have those good fats. So they say that fish is very good for to prevent lateral sclerosis. Of those fishes, the best are fishes, the part that are expensive, but fishes that come from very cold uh, uh, waters like the salmon, trout, cod, you know, herrings, uh, are cold um, water okay, fishes. Also, you can find, a, you know, um, relatively um, uh, good sources of protein in the poultry. So poultry is better than beef. So the person should reduce the consume of beef and increase the consume of poultry, fish, uh, a fat free or, 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 or low fat, okay, dairy, a, to decrease the intake of saturated fats. Sugar and alcohol promote atherosclerosis. The, the diet should be low in sodium to prevent the, the hypertension. And of course, very rich in vegetables, okay, stuff because, you know, the vegetable, uh, uh, do not help to prevent the atherosclerosis. Uh, diet is frequently tested in English. And you need to have some knowledge of diet, okay? It, uh, I think that I already, uh, you know, reviewed diet with you because diet is, but you are going to teach your clients to, to, to be healthy. When you have a person with these uh, formation of plaques, specifically in the coronary arteries, 
you are going to find the refactor that I mentioned before. So which one you need to give importance? OK, the modifiable. So about the cholesterol, what you want? I want to increase HDL and to decrease LDL and triglycerides. That's why, why I want that, because hypercholesterol, hyperlipidemia is a risk factor for having those plaques. So I want to oppose this risk factor. So I want to decrease the LDL and I want uh, to decrease the triglyceride and I want to increase the HDL. I want to counter, to oppose this risk factor. How? Well, diet, exercise, a diet, but we comment exercise in the statins. Statins can effectively change this parameter. Hypertension is another modifier risk factor. So I want to control my, my hypertension with low pressure medication to low to, to medication to lower my blood pressure. Diabetes is a risk factor. I want to control my diabetes as as best as um, as good as possible. Uh, keeping my A1C below 7%. Tobacco, totally quit, zero. Sedentarism, combat the sedentarism. When this happens, parts of the heart don't receive enough blood and oxygen when the heart needs to work more. Generally, heart needs to work more when the person is exercising. So in when the person is exercising, the part of the heart that is depending of this artery will receive less, less oxygen than they needed to produce ATP to catch up with the increased demand of the exercise. For that reason, this part of the heart will start producing lactic acid. The lactic acid stimulates the nerves of the heart and then the patient presents pain, chest pain. If the obstruction is partial, as you see here in this, in this picture, that the obstruction is partial, still there is, there is blood flowing here. Yes, there is blood passing here. The person, what is going to do when experiencing the chest pain is will stop the exercise that was doing. The patient was climbing stairs, will stop climbing the stairs. The person was walking, will stop walking. When the person stops the exercise, of course, the increased need of oxygen that this part of the heart will, uh, will decrease. So now, the little amount, the little amount of blood that is flowing through this narrowing of the artery will be enough. And then the production of lactic acid will stop and the pain disappears. So what means that? That the, this angina that the patient experience is reversible. So appears the person stops exercising and the pain disappears. So no infarction, no death of tissue has occurred. Only transient ischemia with transient production of lactic acid. And the patient, when they stop exercising, recovers. This type of angina is called stable angina. And the patient can predict the amount exercise needed to produce the pain. This kind of stable angina can be treated with medications. So as I said before, frequently doctors order aspirin. While to prevent the formation of this clot, you remember the clot that can form here? Uh, there are other, other alternatives to the aspirin, like the clopidogrel, or the passive drill, okay, that we'll, we'll mention at the end when we finish these uh, chapters in upcoming classes, we'll mention a little the pharmacology of those antiplatelet medication. Also, doctor will prescribe medication to calm down the heart. Hey, heart, 
don't do so much exercise because when you do exercise is when appears the ischemia, the production of lactic acid and the pain. So I'm going to give you a beta blocker, which is a medication that is going to tell the heart, hey, slow down, go to rest, to rest, beta blocker, okay? Some patients that have no tolerance of the beta blocker do better with calcium channel blockers like diltiazem or verapamil that do exactly the same, put the heart at rest, yes? And also they are going to give the client um, a medication to dilate the arteries and the veins and to promote the circulation and to decrease preload and afterload. This medication is the nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin need to be well known by you because it can be used PRN as needed when the patient presents chest pain, but also can be taken around the clock, okay, to prevent the um the chest pain. And of course, usually statins, okay, uh, is prescribed to stabilize and to stop the growth of those plaques. If the doctor considers necessary, they can enter, they can enter with a catheter inside, inside this partially obstructed artery. So they can enter here, they can enter here and they can, uh, you know, work here opening this. This, this is called cardiac catheterization. And we'll talk a little about this because this topic is very important. Doctors will do studies in the clients, include uh, the um, image, like for example, the MUGA scan, M-U, MUGA scan, M-U, sorry, M multi uh, uh, gate uptake gain acquisition is the, the acronym of this. It's, a, it's like an X-ray but is with radioactive substances injected in the person. It's called MUGA scan. And they can see very well the areas of ischemia. It's the use of isotopes of radionucleides to see the heart. Or they can do a stress test, a stress test, okay? Uh, they can uh, do catheterism, okay, to evaluate the client. I think I don't think this is going to be those uh, is information that is not important for test purposes. Uh, an important detail that I want you to know is that troponin, the cardiac enzymes, don't do not elevate in angina because the troponin elevates only in the infarction when there is death of cells and there is disruption of the cell wall. Troponin is normal in angina. There is a variety. Okay, unstable angina is when a person that usually presents the chest pain when walking five blocks now presents the pain when walking only one block. What means that the, the, the plaque is growing, the plaque is complicated, the plaque is unstable, the situation is unstable. It did, this need to be managed is the same as a myocardial infarction because it's a patient that is an imminent risk of a myocardial infarction or is ha already having a myocardial infarction. Uh, the, um, there is a variety of angina that has been tested. It's called Prinzmeral angina. I, I, when I used to study very young, when they say, I, they say heavy metal, <laughs> okay, Prince, yeah, Prince metal angina. Okay, uh, uh, in this patient, the patient one day presents an intense chest pain, chest pain, and the chest pain is at rest, not during exercise. And then they think there is a myocardial infarction and they bring the patient to the ER. 
when the patient arrived to the ER, they, uh, they, if the patient is still having pain, they can see an ST elevation of the ST segment, an elevation of the ST segment, and can think that is an infarction. But then the troponin does not elevate. And then when they do a cardiac catheterization, they find that they are not obstruction. They are not plaque of cholesterol. They say, why this patient, this patient had an angina? They were elevation of the SD segment that returned to normal after the pain disappears. But they are not plaques. Why this happens? And the answer is basospasm. Remember that arteries are pipes, but sometimes the pipes can make, because they want, we're not going to be, to be concerned about that. They can make a vasospasm. Of course, when the artery makes this vasospasm, the blood is not flowing, and then the patient has pain. And it's called Prince metal angina. It's a vasospasm angina, no plaque of ateroma. The pain at rest, normal cardiac troponin. And then they prescribe calcium channel blockers, okay, to those clients. Okay. Calcium channel blockers are the treatment of choice of the Prince metal angina. They don't need um, uh, uh, statins. They don't need aspirin. They don't need beta blockers. I'm contraindicated the beta blocker. They need calcium channel blockers. Okay, just in case you have okay a question of Prince metal angina. When the person has a clot, a clot form over the plaque is when the blood, zero blood flows, and is when the person has the myocardial infarction. This can occur in any moment, but frequently occurs in the morning. We don't know why exactly. And uh, this, uh, this phenomenon is a pain that appears at rest and doesn't improve with the nitroglycerin. That's the reason for which the, the experts say, hey, if you suffer of angina, but you have a chest pain, and you put the first tablet of nitroglycerin under your tongue, and you wait five minutes, and the pain doesn't disappear with only one tablet, only one tablet, five minutes after the first tablet, call 911. Gain time. Save time. Continue placing the second tablet under the tongue and even the third tablet if the pain is still persists. But if with the first tablet the pain doesn't improve after five minutes, call 911. Go to the hospital. Don't 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 uh, be overconfident. Chest pain is present both in angina and myocardial infarction. But in angina, the chest pain tends to be during exercise, while in myocardial infarction tends to be at rest. Okay, at rest. That's why the Prince metal angina is confused with myocardial infarction. The big difference of the patient having a myocardial infarction is that it is not reversible. It is irreversible. So the changes that the patient will present in the EKG will not return to normal immediately. And the death of the cells of the myocardium will produce elevation of the troponin. And this is what makes the difference. Uh, the troponin doesn't elevate immediately. Troponin takes a couple of hours to start elevating. So even if troponin is what confirm that the patient is having a myocardial infarction, we don't have this confirmation immediately that the patient arrived with the pain. Probably the EKG, the EKG will be more useful for the early, immediate diagnosis of myocardial infarction because the EKG will present alteration almost always, not always, almost always since the moment in which the myocardial infarction is, is installing, is, is beginning, you know? So 
what is earlier uh, to diagnose am I the EKG? This question was in the in the anchor. So what you do first, the troponin of the EKG, the EKG, what can give you earlier information of the myocardial infarction, the EKG. The classical transmural myocardial infarction elevates the ST segment. This horizontal line that goes from the QRS to the T wave. This is the ST segment. So there is elevation of the ST segment. It's an STEMI. It's an ST MI, ST elevation MI. It's the classical infarction. Sometimes the infarction don't have, doesn't have the elevation of this segment. So it's called non ST elevation MI. Okay. This is for the doctors. It's not for us. Both are myocardial infarction. Okay. What is important for us is to understand the pain is constant in myocardial infarction, is generally appears at rest and frequently doesn't improve with nitroglycerin. Nevertheless, there are some uh, patients, some clients that have a myocardial infarction and the pain is not present or is very atypical. This phenomenon is more common in women than in men, making more difficult the diagnosis of myocardial infarction in this kind of patient. It doesn't mean that a, a woman cannot have chest pain. Yes, a woman can have a chest pain the same as a, as a man. But sometimes some women could have a myocardial infarction without chest pain. And we need to be very careful because the symptoms tend to be very atypical. Uh, shortness of breath, fatigue, uh, you know, physical fatigue or digestive symptoms can replace the classical chest pain. The other clients that can have a myocardial infarction without pain is the diabetic client. Diabetics develop uh, neuropathies that can produce anesthesia. Okay, and for that reason, they don't have the pain. And very old people, you know, sometimes, you know, old people, everything ends in what? Confusion. Old people, very old people, have a UTI, a urinary tract infection, confusion. Have a pneumonia, confusion. Have, a, a, you know, a, a, a subdural hematoma, confusion. Have a myocardial infarction, confusion. <laughs> have medication that are producing toxicity, confusion. So you need to know that it's a common presentation in older people. So a high level of suspicion, a high level of knowing that there are people at risk, like a woman who has 50, 60 years old, is already in the menopause and lost the protection that the estrogens had for the women, and suffer a high cholesterol, is obese, is diabetic, and has a hypertension. And, and it's a smoker, so she can have a myocardial infarction, but may be present without pain. In the myocardial infarction, what defines the myocardial infarction is the elevation of the troponin. What they do with those patients? Well, this is a priority. They are ICU. Uh, there are stuff that can be given. Okay, uh, nitroglycerin usually are given. Nitroglycerin. Uh, what is the contraindication of nitroglycerin? A person that is taking erectile dysfunction medication, sildenafil, taldalafil, badalafil, any alfil, okay? Any medication contraindicate the use of nitroglycerin. Or a person that has very low blood pressure, a person that has less than 90 uh, millimeters of mercury of systolic blood pressure. So, uh, could be the contraindication of nitroglycerin. What side effect? Okay, drops the blood pressure. You need to monitor the blood pressure, keep the patient recumbent, and um, headache. That's it. Uh, if the pain doesn't disappear with nitroglycerin, but you give morphine. So when we give morphine, when the pain doesn't improve with the nitroglycerin, what we do for the nitroglycerin? Pain doesn't improve with the nitroglycerin, but we give morphine. Why is so important the nitroglycerin and the morphine for the pain? Because if the patient has pain, cells are dying. Lactic acid is produced and cells are dying. If we can't uh, remove the pain 
with nitro or with morphine, we are stopping the process of death of cells. That's why it's, it's beyond pain. It's beyond the horrible sensation of pain. It's because when we stop the pain, we stop the death of cells. When we give aspirin, always, unless the patient is allergic to aspirin. So we ask the client to chew a tablet of aspirin and to swallow that. This is the A or the Mona. And when we give oxygen only, O-N-L-Y, only if the O2 saturation of the patient is below 95%. Evidence demonstrated that giving oxygen as a routine in myocardial infarction increases mortality. So giving oxygen to the other clients is no, no. So only oxygen is given if the O2 saturation is below 95%. Uh, some patients are going to receive fibrinolytic therapy, tissue plasmic activator. For what? To dissolve this clot that I said is producing the total obstruction. Okay. Uh, there is a window period that uh, by the Food and Drug Administration, six hours, by the American Heart Association, is 10 hours, in which there is benefit receiving that. So it's very important that the nurse in the assessment be precise, determining when exactly, at what time the pain started, to determine if the patient is still in the window period in which is going to receive benefit of the fibrinolytic therapy. Remember that it's a very potent medication that can produce horrible hemorrhages, hemorrhages and could be contraindicated in certain case, cases like the pregnancy. No, pregnancy is very rare to have a migraine infarction, like a brain hemorrhage, an aneurysm in the brain, uh, you know, recent surgery, et cetera. Yes. Uh, it's expected that if the patient, the, the dissolution of the clot, the clot is successful, the patient after uh, the flow in this necrotic area or ischemic area of the heart is reestablished by the reperfusion, by the, the thrombolytic therapy, this is going to produce cardiac dysrhythmia. So the patient needs to be in a monitor and probably doctor will indicate amiodarone, et cetera. And sometimes doctors need to be more aggressive and need to do a catheterism. And in the catheterism, they are going to place an stent Okay, are going to place an stent to open uh, uh, the, the circulation and sometimes the stent is not entering and then the doctors need to open the heart and do bypass, are going to take pieces of a vein of the client, generally the saphenous vein, to make bridges, to make bypasses, okay, to bypass the obstruction or even arteries, like for example, the um, internal mammary artery to do the bypass. The most common cause of death in cardiac catheterization is the ventricular dysrhythmia, specifically BTAC without pulse and ventricular fibrillation. So we need to study very well those dysrhythmias. In the cardiac catheterism, remember that they are going to use iodine so you need to ask for allergy to iodine and you need to evaluate the renal function because iodine is nephrotoxic. So the patient needs to have normal creatinine. If it is a diabetic line that so frequently have ischemic problems, if they are taking metformin, which is a by one night, should be discontinued uh, previous to the catheterism and cannot be restarted until two days after the catheterism. After the procedure, there is a risk of bleeding because the classical catheterism make a hole in the femoral artery, in the groin. So we need to monitor the distal pulses at two extremities to be sure there is no obstruction of this femoral artery and check for signs of bleeding. At the side of this artery is the nerve that gives the sensation of the leg, so any compression of the nerve is going to manifest as numbness and, and, and and tinglings, okay, that need to be reported. The patient need to be resting for several hours after the catheterism to prevent bleeding in the groin. And you need to encourage fluid intake to promote the elimination of the iodine. The next class that we have, we will be studying then cardiac dysrhythmias, which is the um, 
other topics that we need to cover of this chapter. This is what I have for you today, guys. Do you have any question, any doubt, or I overwhelmed you with information? No are, you, are you there? Are you alive? Oh, no, you, are, yes. you, are, you are there. Okay, you are there. Yes, okay. yes thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So, thank you. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your attention and see you the next class to continue cardiovascular. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Good night. Good night.